Hello everyone, my name's Claire Cherry um, and here on Anne Boleyn Day I'm here to talk about George Boleyn, her brother. Um, as you may know, uh, Claire and I, a couple of years ago now, uh, published a biography on George's life um, and I'm here really, the intention was to talk mainly about his poetry but I'm going to go back a little bit just to say how I came involved in him in the first place, how I became interested in him and that would have been about 2006 maybe a little bit before that. At that time, I knew categorically that Thomas Boleyn had pimped his daughters out to the king. I knew categorically that Anne had six fingers. I knew without question that Jane Boleyn had um, accused her husband of incest and that she was one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that he got caught up in all of this. But I didn't really know a huge amount about George Boleyn. Um, and in 2006, or just before that, I had read a book that was really popular. I've never previously really read much historical fiction, but I thought I'd try it, and it was a book called The Other Berlin Girl. And in that book, um, I got really interested in George, but he was, in the book, in love with another courtier. And that was something that I'd never really heard of before. So it got me interested in him, just to have a look. So I googled him. Um, just to see what the position was, because I'd read people like um, uh, Starkey, and he'd never mentioned any of that. And at the back of the book, there was reference to an author called Rita Warnick, who had come up with the theory of George's homosexuality. But I'd never heard it anywhere else, so I, I mainly thought that it was fiction. And just basically looking at George's life and Googling him, I just became interested in him. And I couldn't really see um, any reason why he'd become defamed so much over the past 30 years or so in fiction. Um, he's been uh, shown as a rapist, um, a wife abuser, um, a fairly pointless young man, sneering idiot, all the rest of it. And as I became more interested in him and started looking him up, I realised that all of that was pure fiction. Um, I couldn't really see where it had started because when I looked at books about George um, immediately following his death and in the 17 and 1800s, he hadn't really been abused or demonised in any way. It really seemed quite a, a recent thing. And bearing in mind everybody pretty much realises that Anne and George were innocent of the crimes they were accused of. I couldn't really see why that was so. So initially I thought about writing a, a pamphlet, just setting out all of the um, myths about George and trying to put them right. And gradually, as I um, researched him more and more, I realised how much information was out there about him, far more than I had ever thought. During my research on George, um, I came to realise actually Anne didn't have six fingers. Thomas Boleyn didn't really pimp his daughters out to the king. Jane Boleyn may, in fact, be innocent of um, accusing her husband. That came as a hard one for me to get come to terms with because I was so used to seeing her portrayed that way. I think it's getting your mind around something different. Then I read um, Julia Fox's book and I had to grip my teeth and accept that maybe she wasn't guilty after all. So I came to learn a lot of other things while I was researching George. But as far as George is concerned, that pamphlet then became a book. And I started um, corresponding with Claire Ridgway, I, I think it was probably about late 2009, early 2010. We became friendly. I sent her my original manuscript, which we then both worked on to jointly publish the book. And then it was a book. It was a really in-depth look at George's life, far more than I had anticipated it would be when I first started. Um, I realised that George was a um, was a, a, a diplomat, a very good politician. He'd been sent on embassies for um, Henry VIII. So he wasn't some idiot, not some sneering fool that is portrayed in certain books. Um, he was a very intelligent, clever young man. He was uh, governor, became governor of Dover, Dover Castle, um, Lord Warden of the St. Ports, um, all sorts of things. He was sent uh, by Henry to convocation to um, argue the case for supremacy. What I had intended to speak to you about today was his poetry. So I'll go into that part of, of what I um, researched in relation to that.
The only thing that really I had seen about George's poetry was there was a comment in a book by Starkey in his Six Wives book who said that um, George was a recognised court poet. Um, and he said in that book something, it was it was comment something like, um, he, George, proved that the pen was mightier than the sword, something like that. So then I started looking into the research on George's poetry. And I came to realise, actually, that um, he was a brilliant court poet and his um, reputation was right up there with people like Surrey, who was his cousin, and Thomas Wyatt, who was a very good friend of the Berlin's. Wyatt and Surrey are both really renowned for their poetry. George wasn't. And I think one of the main reasons behind that is because most of his poetry has been destroyed. We don't really know what he wrote. There's nothing that has actually survived. Maybe a couple of pieces that have survived, um, but we don't really know what. It could even be that they were taken over by other poets, and so that poetry that he wrote um, has been... Um, people think that other people wrote it and has been assigned to other people. But how do we, so if we haven't got that poetry, how do we know that he was a court poet? Well, there's, there's various um, pieces of information that have come down to us over the years. One of the main ones, and I'll, I'll um, read this, George Cavendish, although he was rather abusive of George Blaine, did say to him, of him, God gave me grace, day nature did her part, endowed me with gifts of natural qualities. But he goes on to say, Dame elegance also taught me the art in nature and verse to make pleasant ditties. That's maybe a little bit um, patronising, but, but the reality of that was that the least Cavendish knew that George Boleyn was a poet. Um, we have various other pieces of information that have come down to us, but one of them and this one I found really interesting. There was um, annexed to a selection of poems by George Gascoigne, is this comment. Chaucer, by writing perchance fame, and Gower got a worthy name. Sweet Surrey sucked Penissa's springs, and Wyatt wrote of wondrous things. And now, with regards to George, old Rochford claimed the stately throne, which muses hold in Helicon. Then thither come good Gascoigne go, for sure his verse deserves so. So basically, George Boleyn was being held and being spoken about in the same way as Chaucer, Gower, Surrey, Wyatt. For him to be quoted, and that was quite recently after his death, um, in that, that way, clearly shows to me that he was thought during his lifetime to be right up there with them. Um, Muses in Greek mythology were the nine daughters of Zeus. They were the goddesses of inspiration and literature, science and arts. Um, they were the personification of knowledge and the arts, but more particularly literature, dance and music. So basically, Richard Smith, and this was written in, the 15, in 1575, means that 41 years after George's death, was showing that George's reputation of a, of a poet of great merit um, survived Henry VIII's purge of the name Boleyn. So the reality is he was a very clever young man. Not only was he a courtier of merit, um, a politician, an ambassador for Henry VIII, he was also a renowned poet. So how is it that over the last 30 years he has been so demonised, mainly in works of fiction? Well, I really don't know the answer to that. Um, he was accused, or, or rather, Reetha Warnick considered that he was homosexual in her book in 1989. So what? If he was, it's no big deal. I don't really think there's any evidence to prove that. She came up with that theory based on Cavendish saying that he was a womanizer. I don't get from Cavendish accusing him of being a womanizer to him being a homosexual. That just never made any sense to me. Um, he was apparently in love with Mark Smeaton, and the reason she comes up, comes up with that is because George lent a book to Mark Smeaton once. Again, I don't really get the relevance of that, but if he was, he was. But I think that following that, a lot of the demonisation is that um, you, you kind of think, wonder whether it's a little bit homophobic, because from being a homosexual, he's turned into a rapist. From being a homosexual, he's been um, accused of abusing his wife. And again, I don't get that. What, 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 how does that lead on from that? He's often portrayed as somewhat of a fool. Um, I don't think 
fiction writers really like the idea that Anne's brother was actually a really renowned poet, that he was a really clever courtier, that he was a diplomat, etc., etc., etc. They don't like that. It's easier just to wheel him out to die at the end and be accused of incest with Anne. I think the other Berlin girl really didn't do the Berlins a great deal of justice. There was um, an indication in that that they had, that Anne and George had actually committed incest in order to pass a child off as Henry's. Um, that and, and George Berlin being homosexual showed him to be somewhat of a sexual deviant, and it's kind of gone on from there. He's, I mean, mantle his portrayal of George is just appalling. What also sickened me with that portrayal of George was how she says of him um, she puts into Cromwell's mouth a suggestion that George only wrote poetry and you'll have to excuse me here so that he could stick his cock in as many women as he could now that's Mantle's um, comments and, and from everything that I know about George and everything that Claire and I have researched on his life I can't see that he deserves such a vile comment. Um, that obviously wasn't Cromwell. Cromwell and George were singing from the same hymn sheet as far as religious reform is concerned because George was very deeply into religious reform and he spent his last moments on the scaffold preaching a, pretty much a sermon to the masses about the reform, reform of the Catholic Church. So it's highly doubtful that Cromwell would have thought of George Boleyn in that way. Um, so that's Mantle's um, obscenity, it's certainly not Cromwell's. You've then got people that have um, acted as George Boleyn in various plays. In the series of the um, Mantle books, you've got the person that um, portrayed George as calling him a jumped up wanker. Um, clearly, that person had no idea what he was talking about. He knows Mantle's version of George Boleyn, of course, that's fiction. And I think people do get really um, tied up with fiction and it becomes difficult sometimes to know what's truth and what's fiction, particularly when you've got certain authors who like to portray themselves as being very historically accurate. And you've got Gregory that does that and you've got Mantle that does that in a lot of the um, comments she makes to newspapers and a lot of her interviews. So if you've got them saying that, and their portrayal of George Boleyn is a rather wishy-washy young man, certainly in the case of Mantle, who is um, rude, he's, he's abusive to his wife. What do you believe? Because if you haven't read a book on George, if you haven't read where there is an actual portrayal of the real person, what do you believe? Um, and I think that's why Claire and I really wanted to get our book out on him, to put those myths into... put them to bed, if you pardon the pun... Um, because he wasn't like that. And there is no evidence to say he was like that. Just like there's no evidence to say that Jane Boleyn um, gave evidence about the incest. Yes, she told the court that um, Anne had admitted to her that Henry had sexual problems. But that is the only piece of evidence we have linking Jane Boleyn to the trials. Everything else is made up. It's fiction. It's fiction that George Boleyn um, abused his wife. Now, that, I think, stems from um, Alison Weir's Lady in the Tower. In that book, she says that George probably um, sexually abused his wife or, or treated her um, to unnatural sexual practices. Where the hell does that come from? Um, it's just been plucked out of thin air, just like Warnick's theory of homosexuality was plucked out of thin air. No evidence is provided for that whatsoever, um, but it's been followed up in recent works of fiction. So now George has raped his wife. He raped her in the Tudors. I don't really understand what George Boleyn possibly could have done to have warranted that sort of abuse being labelled against him. He was not that sort of person, and it's high time um, that we really started looking at the Boleyns as they really were, and not how they are reflected in fiction, not how they are reflected in myths, um, and obviously I feel very strongly about that, as you can probably see. But next time you read something about George Boleyn, next time he's gone to the other level, and God knows what he could be accused of next, I have no idea, but, but if you read that, please remember that it's fiction. Please remember that there is no evidence whatsoever to show him in that way. And also, if you're reading a piece of poetry from the Tudor era, think maybe that George perhaps may have written it. 
Um, one piece of poetry that is um, uh, often um, said that it was possibly him that wrote it, although um, apparently in, in certain aspects it's, it's supposed to be Wyatt that wrote this, but it's certainly being attributed to him, to him not long after his death by somebody who um, was very um, scrupulous about um, assigning the right poetry to the right, per right person. And the last paragraph of that reads... Now cease my lute, this is the last, labour that thou and I shall waste, and ended is that we begun. Now is this song both sung and past, my lute be still, for I have done. Quite prophetic, and I do really love that piece of poetry. Um, so that's me, that's my talk. I hope um, in future George will be treated with a little bit more respect, the respect that he deserves as an innocent young man who doesn't deserve what's heaped on him in works of fiction. So thank you very much for listening.